I'm going to talk today about something we've been singing about, and actually, Keely was wearing this in a meeting we had this week, and I said, I, I want to help, let that help me, I want to use this. Everybody say, he still does miracles. How many of you believe he still does miracles? I'm excited about that. I told this a little earlier in the first service, but I want to start with it because it's so interesting. Uh, the, the fellow who we turned the church over to back in Mississippi, uh, he, he gave me this information uh, saying that uh, they, they're getting ready to build a church there, the campus, that the church that we were pastoring. And I'm excited about that. But he said as they're developing, they wanted to see the type of churches that are being built now. And so they went to a couple of cities and they went to this one church, I believe in Dallas, and at this church, uh, they were seeing everything, and he looked to someone that was with him. He said, I, I don't know what kind of church this is. And so they went over to somebody that was hosting them, viewing the church, says, you know what, tell me about your church. And so they explained a little bit about it, kind of a non-denominational church, but they said, we don't believe in miracles, though. And he didn't know what to say. And I don't know when you read the Bible and you understand how we look at all these things that we do and how we know the experiences we have had that you can't believe in miracles. Miracles is uh, very important to what we do because our God is not just a God, but He is the God before natural restrictions and He's the God during natural restrictions, nature as some people call it. He's the God of eternity, and nothing is impossible with God. He's able to do anything. And in so many ways, our enemy tries to put a little doubt in our minds and get us to look at things in a way in which we think, you know, the times are bad. And if you listen to everything that everybody's saying on news, on just social events, on everything, you're going to be negative, and you're going to think there's no way out of this. Well, God's the answer for all of it. And I'm going to talk about that today. But before we get there, let's have a little fun with some safety tips that might come from our world. 20% of fatal accidents, of all fatal accidents, happen in cars. So don't, don't drive anywhere anymore, okay? 17% of all accidents happen at home. You can't even go home today. It's bad. This world's bad. 16% of accidents happen in boats or trains or planes. No cruises, no flights, nothing. Because, you know, something could happen. 15% of all accidents happen to pedestrians. You can't even walk anywhere. You have to stay here all the time. It's the safest place in the world, right here in a worship service. And so, anyway, listen to this, though. Because this goes into what I'm going to get to a little bit about Jesus walking on water and Peter coming to him in water in the storm that brought all of that about, because this is a truth. It's estimated that about 360,000 people die from drowning every year, and that comes from uh, an international injury-related deaths article. And I want you to look at these major miracles that happen, as we see recorded in Matthew, and I want you to, to just really hold the view of this with you through some of the storms you're going to go through in life. Because the background to this miracle is that Jesus was teaching, and crowds have been getting bigger. But this particular time, there were 5,000 men, which means there were probably 15,000 there, if you count the women and the children. That's, that's an amazing thing in itself, just thinking about that. That's, you know, that's the size of most of the basketball arenas we have around the country. And uh, at the end of this teaching, the excitement was great, but the hunger was also great. And Penny wasn't there, so they had to do something. Thank God for Penny. All these things that happen that you see food around here, it's just marvelous. So anyway, what are they going to do? But there was a little boy there, and he had five loaves and two fishes. And I think a lot of you are already familiar with the story. And it's just kind of like crazy how this all turned out and what ends up happening because Jesus took this food and he began to break it the fish and the loaves, and it multiplied and it multiplied and it multiplied and it multiplied until probably about 15,000 people were no longer hungry. And there were even baskets that were left over. Now, because of that, people turned not 
to the miracle so much, but to what they would see as Jesus being this influential, powerful, anything that can be done, he can do this. And they saw that Israel may be set free from the rule of Rome, and they would be their own nation again. It just turned political. And in essence, Jesus didn't want to have anything to do with that. So he put his, had his disciples, the twelve, to get in a boat and told them to go to the other side. And then he went up to the mountain to pray. And that sounds like that is the way it should be because it was Jesus. And he prayed long. In fact, we're going to pick up this story in Matthew, the 14th chapter, starting with verse 22. It says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Well, he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. In other words, somewhere between 3 and 4 o'clock, he comes to them in this terrible situation. Came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately... Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it's I, do not be afraid. Then Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, and this is the important piece of this message. And he said, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came toward him. This story is recorded in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. And I feel that's important because it lets us know it's a very significant story. Obviously, it is. It's such a powerful part of the entire ministry of Jesus. But it also lets us know that there are some different views and memories that these writers had. And it gives us a real good picture, a complete picture, I would say. So Jesus did intentionally send them into a... Hurricane-type storm. They were blown off course. They were in the middle of the sea. When you're in the middle of the sea, you're not close to any shore. And I've been on the Sea of Galilee. Believe me, you're not. And they'd been, they'd been working. They had to be so worn out. And so they were obviously, from what we read, very afraid. And so there is uh, something that Jesus is teaching them in this. And he's also teaching us. And I want us to glean from this today so our faith can move forward into understanding miracles and how we're able to see God move in His promises and miracles will come. So it's a lesson about what to do when you feel like you're sinking, when you're about to drown. And all of us have had times in life when we feel like we're just going under with circumstances. And when you feel that you're, you're, you're going under and the waves are batting up against your boat of life and everything's just not looking good. What do you do, and how do you trust God? I'm going to give you three points in just a moment here, but I want to give you the signs of when you're sinking and give you then these points. You may be sinking when you're feeling it financially, in relationships, emotionally, when you're drained and you feel like in life you're going under. So look for these things. First of all, I know I'm sinking when I can't see my way. You just feel like I'm in the dark. Most of us have never really seen total darkness, occasionally maybe. And it's a, it's a different feeling. Uh, when I was in college, I worked for Avis Rent-A-Car, and we had to drive no matter what to get cars to where they needed to be. And sometimes uh, it was as if we drove right before they completely closed the interstates. And you get next to a truck and a car, and literally, there's a little bit of light, but you cannot see where you're going. A little bit of the light on the trucks and occasionally maybe a stripe in the road. It'll keep you going. And that's probably how these disciples felt, that they were still in the boat. It hadn't been overtaken, but it was dark. Scripture says in John 6, by now it was dark. But you get confused. And life is uh, not the way it is when things aren't lit up. 
Number two, I know I'm sinking when I feel I'm on my own. That's not good. You can't make it in life when you feel like or when you literally are on your own. Nobody else is helping. I don't know where God is. I feel out of touch with God. The Bible says in John 6, Jesus was not yet there. And the significant part to that is when you're not close to Jesus, and that's our decision, you're really going to feel alone. You can be in a crowd. You might be out in the world in a great big old party, everybody just all over the place. But when you're not close to Jesus, you're going to be alone. No doubt about it. So even though they felt the storm, the storm was sinking their boat, you have to understand that feeling of being alone, that feeling of maybe this boat is now going to totally sink is like nothing else in the world. A survey in the University of Chicago said one in four Americans feel that nobody really understands them. They feel all alone. You think about that. That's one out of four people. Just go into the grocery store and start counting. That's the reason that uh, everybody needs to have Penny and my personality. We just talk to everybody. We love everybody. There's nothing that I can't say to anybody about anything, and particularly Jesus. It's important for us to be aware. That might not be your personality. I do get that. But everybody is lonely, and somehow we need to try to find those. That's why we're in this campaign, because there is a more percentage out there that don't know Jesus than do, and we need to make sure we become the church that can reach them like never before. I read something. Go ahead. It's worth claiming it. I read something just a couple of days ago that Fayetteville is one of three cities in North Carolina, but all three of them make the fastest growing cities in America now. Isn't that an important piece for us to know? That's a great responsibility. That's a great responsibility that we have. I know I'm going to be sinking when I feel I'm out of my comfort zone. And I know we could all raise our hand and say there have been times when we have been out of that place where we feel comfortable with everything. I grew up not to be talking to everybody. I was extremely shy, put me in a group of people, and I was uncomfortable. We all have things that make us uncomfortable. So they wanted a miracle. They're in the boat and they wanted a miracle. But what they got, and Peter was the one who got it, was a word. And that's an extremely significant piece because Romans 10, 17 shows us the path to the miracles we've been singing about. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So we got to hear this. This is crucial. There's a lot of people who really believe God. They really believe His promises, and they really believe for things, and they'll go out and say, I'm believing for my healing. I have found out, because I often ask this, what are you standing on in His Word? That's what makes it happen. Um, uh, and they can't say anything. Or it could be other things, like I'm praying for my children, and, it's a, and, and then I ask them, well, what do you, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything. The Bible says a lot about praying for our children. And we, we've got to train them up in the way they should go. They're never going to depart from it. They may depart the way they're walking for a while, but it's always in their heart. You keep bringing your kids to church, and I promise you back here, they're going to carry that with them for the rest of their life. I have been and pastored people that said, 40 years ago I walked away from God. But it never got out of my heart. And I knew it was my answer. Thank God for a church uh, that says, let's invest in our children. Let's make our programs better. Let's have vacation Bible school. Let's do things that en en enable our children to come to know him. So you've got to take it on his word that God's going to work. People like this are sincere. They, sincere. They, they, you know, they, they want healing. They want their children. They want a breakthrough. So many things. And oftentimes they say, I'm just standing on my faith. I believe God. But God has given us just a book full of promises. Promises that are genuine, that are proven, that work, that are real. We used to sing that old song, standing on the promises that cannot fail. 
You know, standing on things that are real. The world will tell you stuff. Just turn your TV on to the news channels. They're going to predict and they're going to be wrong. They're going to say and they have no idea. They're going to put fear in your heart. Get into the Word of God. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Come to the house of God and hear the preaching of the Word. I might be a little bit old and preach like an older person, but it's still the Word. Daryl might be middle-aged, and my Lord, can he ever preach. It's definitely the Word of God. There might be some young people that come here and preach, but if they're in the Word, it's going to be all right. I believe in this. I've lived by it. I raised your pastor's wife by it and her brother, and now we're getting a chance on Elan, and I'm so excited about it. There is hope beyond hope. She's a generation away from my wife, but I tell you, they are identical. They are so cool. So wonderful. People just don't need to operate in man-made strength. The very waters that the children of Israel, directed by Moses, who was constantly hearing what God said for their deliverance and what they were doing, they walked across by the waters being separated on dry ground. They didn't have any mud on their boots. And that same river, that same sea, that they walked across on dry land with water all around them. Pharaoh and his army drowned in. And it's simple. It's an easy answer. You could answer it. Because Moses had a word and Pharaoh didn't have a word. Moses was operating in the promise of God and proclaimed what God told him to do and what was in the word. And it worked. I'm telling you today that we can be as powerful as we believe in the promises and the Word of God. It's time for a church in troubled times to once again stand up say, I believe it. I believe God's promises. I claim broad God's promises and not just say it, but have them in our heart. Have it hidden in our heart. <clears throat> Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. Well, what was, what was he saying? Just give me the word. Just tell me. You, he actually told him what he wanted him to say, but then God gave him the word. He could have said it, and it would have never worked. But when Jesus said, come, he stepped out, and he walked. Now here's the key. He was not walking on water. He was walking on the word. If he did not have the word, he couldn't have walked to where Jesus was. He got a word and he walked on it. And when you get a word, you can depend on it. We know what Jesus has said. We know what can happen. The law of nature says it can't happen. But you have a word from God. It leads to a miracle. It's impossible without the word. But the word supersedes nature. Once you've heard from God, it's all different. In fact, I'll call it you become the exception. Well, what, what's that mean? Well, it means like Sarah was 90 years old and she was telling everybody that God told her she's going to have a child. I hope God doesn't tell my wife she's going to have a child <laughs> at 90. And she really didn't want to believe it herself, but she had God's word. And she knew that it was a promise that had God's word in it. And she became the exception. She had a word from God, and she had a child. And that's exactly how it works. You, you can't go into a lion's den like Daniel did and not get eat up by all those lions. But he had a word, and he went in there. and uh, Yeah, we can get excited. And, and God was good. You can't go into the fire and not be burned. You can when you've heard from God. And the three Hebrew children became an exception. And you know, you might say, well, aren't there instances after Jesus ascended and went on to where the disciples saw miracles and they just spoke? They had a word that they got from God. But you see, here's what happened. And this is very, very significant. One day... Peter, I mean, Jesus was asking them, who, who do men say that I am? They had a lot of answers about various prophets, other different things. And then Simon Peter had a revelation. And he said, thou art the Christ. Which means that Jesus was the one who was coming that would have this authority. And Jesus said, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let me tell you what you and I have. When we get into a situation, just like in Acts, the third chapter, where Peter and John walked to have church early in the morning on the steps of the temple, what happened to them was there was a beggar who had been there for years, and he was asking for alms. And so in that authority that Peter had in the name of Jesus, he turned to him and he said, you may be begging for money, silver and gold have I none, and grabbed him in the name of Jesus. That's the word because of what Jesus said. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So we can go out into this world and we come up against situations and we immediately need to respond. We have a name that's above every name. There's no name like the name of Jesus. There's no other answer like the name of Jesus. He's the one who came to give us the authority He came that we might have power more than anything the world has ever seen before. We have that authority. Everybody say in the name of Jesus. Some of you are are saying, I I, I can't become an exception like the three Hebrew children. I can't become an exception like Daniel or or like Sarah having a child at 90. And I want to tell you, you can. And once again, I say, because you have the word. You have the promise that we have in the name of Jesus. You have all of the things that you need to be able to move forward in Jesus and know that God's going to do miraculous things. And that brings me to these two things that come together. He still does miracles. And as this being the closing of just how, what we're calling the Imagine series, not the campaign, but the series, and Pastor will come in and start a new series, but we're always going to be talking about Looking to what we can see God's going to do. Let's imagine. And that puts us in a tremendous area of miracles. Some of you who've made commitments and some of you who have, have, have made the first fruit uh, offering and now pledges, you, you may not even totally understand how God's going to miraculously uh, work in your life. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. There was a young man that, that I pastored. He was young in the 80s, a teenager. And he posted on Facebook just maybe a couple weeks ago and he said, Pastor David Hale, so I got it, it came to me showing that he had done that, used to teach us at least once a year on generosity and stewardship. And he said, part of what he would always say is, you cannot outgive God. And I'm sure I had other things in there where I was talking about, imagine what God will do when this happens and that happens. And he said, I've lived out that that has always been true. And it showed a picture of him being at a closing, I guess, law firm. Uh, And it shows him, and there weren't a whole lot of details, but basically he was saying that God did this miraculous thing in his life. I haven't talked to him personally about it, but I have learned God took a little and made it into millions because he believed you can't outgive God. You say, well, that may not happen all the time. It's always in different dimensions, but you're going to always reap more than you sow. And this is good seed, and you can believe what God's going to do. Just, just another little story about one time when we did a campaign like this, and there was a, a, a young couple in our church. In fact, she was my receptionist in our office. And uh, after the campaign, I went in my office and did just like Pastor said. I was the only one that looked at him. And I started going through these cards, and I came across one that was like, wow. Maybe I overstated what God can do. Because the commitment was like, uh. so I went to her. She was in the office and said, I want to talk to you and your husband when you get a chance. And she said, I think I know what it's about. And she said, it's amazing what God has done. And I said, really? And so she told me. And uh, many months before that, we had done something special for missionary causes. And anyway, they had felt like having a passion for missions They had received a part of the family's inheritance and it was enough to put away in savings because someday they wanted to build a house because they wanted to have a child even though at the time they said that they weren't going to be able to have children. And so she said, we put that in that offering. And so when we did this commitment, we believe that God's going to take care of all of our needs and God's going to do things for for us. And I said, well, it's okay to, to imagine what God's going to do for the church, which you did, and see what God's going to do for you and believe for that. That's great. She says, but can I tell you what happened? I said, okay. She said, when we gave that offering that we initially got that we were going to put away for a house, she said, uh, the, the uh, sister to our mother that did that uh, heard about it. 
And she, she was trying to figure out what to do with her part of the inheritance. And so she said, I feel like I'm supposed to give it to you guys. And she said, it was amazing. She says, but that's not it. And I says, well, tell me more because you made a big monthly commitment too. Tell me more. She said, well, my husband went to his boss who owned a very significant uh, store that was pretty profitable. It was a men's clothing store. He would actually go into different areas of the state and offer, you know, the, the clothing that like executives of various companies and whatnot. So he had a van that he would take and he would do the measuring and all that kind of stuff. So he went to his boss and he asked his boss, he said, uh, we're ready to do something for the church and we have one car we owe, uh, owe money on and one car that's paid off and we want to sell the car we owe money on so we'll be free of that debt. And I'm wondering if I could just drive the van all the time and... He said, you want to do that for, for your church? And he said, yeah, I want to do that for God. He said, of course, I'm going to let you do that. So that monthly payment, and I'm not going to get into more details, but some other things that God did, and God actually did some things. They got their house. She was able to get pregnant and have a child. And then just a few weeks after all of that, after he told his boss all that had happened, he said, okay, where's your church? I'm coming. I've been praying for a church. He came, and he came right up front, totally surrendered to the Lord. God did an amazing thing in his life and his fiance, and just was amazed at what God was doing. Those are stories that are real. Those are things that God can do. I don't know what your situation may be. I haven't seen them all turn out like that, but I do know what Brad said. You can't outgive God, and God's not going to be in debt to anybody. Be a part of this. Let's be prepared for the growth of Fayetteville. Now, I didn't do this in the beginning because I wanted to wait till right now because I think it's important. It is Memorial Day weekend, and I figured this is probably maybe the best place to do this right before we come to the close of what's happening here. But I want us to pray, and if you would repeat this with me, I think it will be more, even more powerful. This is Memorial Day weekend, and we live in a city where probably there's more emphasis on understanding this than any other. There are people who've come to Fort Bragg, Fort, Fort, Fort Liberty, and they've never come back, never come back to America again. They gave their life. They gave the, the, the ultimate. And I think it's significant that we recognize that in prayer and then pray some things that we, that we want to see God do as we move forward. Uh, repeat this with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the liberty, the freedom that we have, especially to worship and gather in a church like this so our children can learn about God, so we can bring people into the atmosphere of God. And I pray, Lord, that you just allow us to remember the sacrifice. Say it. Remember the sacrifice that these have made. And may we always pray for those that are serving and have served in the name of Jesus. Amen. Give him a hand clap right now. Thank you, Jesus. So let me close with just a couple of items here. And I'll say it again. God still does miracles. You need to make a very simple commitment to yourself that you will not go through a day without saying, God, we thank you for doing miracles. And we're believing you for miracles. We're going to have, we have some Imagine cards that are about the Imagine campaign right up here. I think there may be some out in this lobby, and I don't know who decorated the lobby, our little bitty lobby, which once the campaign's over, we'll have a bigger one. But thank you for decorating that and remembering what today is really all about. But we want you to have a part in enabling us to move forward for these children that we said need to be able to take advantage of the freedom that we have to worship. We want to be able to move forward, and you've probably seen the pictures of what the new lobby is going to be, but there's far more even beyond that. But we're doing that part first. We'll see where God leads us in so many ways. This is a Memorial Day weekend, and so our attendance is not as good as it is every week, but we're getting to the place on many Sundays where we're, we're realizing the crowd. And to go to four services, we can do it, and we will do it. And they're not going to get me to preach four, preach four times. I, I get worn out at two and a half, but I'll try. 
But it's a wonderful thing, is it not? So if you didn't have a chance to do this last week, you can pick these up, do it, and you can do it monthly, but you can also do it with a, an offering that we call a seed offering, or you can do both. But we're going to stand again right now, and we're going to ask God to help us in this time, and he's going to do a marvelous thing. I'm going to ask the singers to come right up and have mics in hand and ready to go because uh, I want us to be able to see what God's going to do as we close this out today. Are you ready for the best in life to yet come? If that's the case, let's sow the best seeds, sow the most prayers, sow into these lives as best as we can. Now I'm going to pray right now, and as I'm praying, if you want to come for prayer, we do this every week. There will be some up here with me that will be praying. I'll come down and I'll do that. And you can come to grab one of these cards, or if you need a touch in your body, or if you need a prayer answered, because there's some things like we talked about today that are going on in your life and you feel like you're in the middle of the storm and your boat may seem to be breaking up. We can pray with you if you would like to come. Maybe you want salvation. Maybe you want the Lord just to pour His Spirit into you as He promised. Fill you to overflowing. Whatever it is, feel free to come. So we're going to sing this and you can come during this time and then after we sing the song, we'll let the rest of you go. But thank you for being here today. I hope you have a good Sunday. I hope you have a good day tomorrow. Father, we come in all the promises proclaiming them. We say, Lord, that you are able to do the exceeding, the abundantly. Above all, we ask or think. Move in our hearts. Move in our lives. Move abundantly, we pray. Give you praise in all of these things. Uh, in Jesus' name.